Welcome everyone. If you are just joining us, we are so glad that you are here today for the League of Women Voters of Nebraska virtual event titled On the Beat, Reflections from Journalists on Their Profession. We do have a one hour session planned for you today and just some general housekeeping as we get started. Again, my name is Angie Taylor. I am serving as virtual event producer. So if you have Zoom questions, you are welcome to pose them. You know, if you need help, you can send messages in chat. Your camera and your mic will remain off during the course of today. We cordially invite you to find your Zoom toolbar. And if it's hidden, you might need to move your mouse around a little bit, but go ahead and find the chat button because we will ask you and encourage you to open the chat feature and send through to us where you are joining us from. We are just so curious on our, our last session last week, we had people joining us from across the state of Nebraska and we just would love to welcome you. You'll also be able to post questions in chat. So it posts, uh, you know, this, using this you know is for a dual reason we want you to be able to find the chat interact with your location where you're joining from and then go ahead and later as we go through post any questions you have mary lee thank you so much for joining us from omaha we're glad that you're here judy and rich are joining from hastings which is wonderful because one of our very own panelists is also from hastings so we love to see strength in numbers we have 15 participants joining so far. We do expect closer to 60 to 70 coming online. So we're giving folks a few more minutes to hop in. We'll get started right at the top of the hour. I'm in sunny Lincoln. And to be honest, I'm so grateful that yesterday's rain happened and then blew on out of here because I tend to like blue skies a lot better. So uh, anyone else? Let's see, I don't see any other chats coming through from our, from our other participants, but we are so glad to have you here today. Did somebody have a question at all? No? All right. Well, we um, have a wonderful session for you here today. Our four panelists have uh, extensive experience and rich perspectives to share with us today. We're so glad that you are joining us here for the League of Women Voters of Nebraska virtual event over the lunch hour, reflections from journalists on their profession. So this is the second of two in a series that we've been doing and we're just so glad that you're here. Judy, also from Hastings, thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad that you're here. As our participant count continues to head northward, we'll be getting started very soon. Uh, we are scrolling a slide deck so you can get to know a little bit more about our panelists or the presenters as we go through today. Remember that as we go through the session, you will be able to ask questions in the chat feature. So uh, if you are just hopping on, we encourage you to introduce yourself, uh, meaning where are you joining us from? Uh, we had uh, folks last week from across the state, and we're always curious to see. So we have Omaha and Hastings represented so far. Thank you so much for being here. We have about one minute remaining until the top of the hour, and then we will go ahead and get started. We're just so grateful that you're joining us today. Ellen from Seward, I love that. I think we should put a capital letter T, the in front, the Ellen from Seward. <laughs> I only have to say that because I know Ellen. Um, I love that you're here and it's good to see you joining us today. All right, everyone, we're getting right here to the top of the hour and we're going to, and Keith from Beaver Lake, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. We are gonna go ahead and get started with today's session. So today for the League of Women Voters of Nebraska, this is the virtual event titled On the Beat, Reflections from Journalists on their profession. So as we go through the day, I want to encourage you, if you haven't already introduced yourself in chat, please do so. Let us know where you're joining from. And as we go through the day, we encourage you to submit questions in that chat pod. And um, so 
as we get started here, I'm going to get ready to turn over the reins to Diane Bystrom, who is our moderator, and she's going to take over uh, the show and facilitate this excellent conversation for today. Thank you all for joining us. Over to you, Diane. All right. Thanks, Angie. Uh, I'm Diane Bystrom uh, and the communication director for the League of Women Voters of Nebraska, also a member of the Defending Journalism and First Amendment Action Team, which uh, organized these webinars last week and today as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier these are being recorded. And so for those that can't join us today, we'll have the recording on our YouTube channel as well as on our uh, website. So. It's my privilege to uh, to introduce these great panelists. I'm really happy that they all made time in their you know, working schedules to be with us today. I'm gonna go alphabetically. Uh, our first panelist is uh, Sharon Chen. She has been a member of Omaha's WOWT uh, Channel 6, which I watch all the time, Sharon. I told you that, it's on my <laughs> channel. Uh, news anchor team since uh, January, 2019. She has very rich experience, and this is so cool about her too, is that she actually began as a reporter, anchor, producer in Scottsville, Nebraska, then went to Lincoln. But then she also has experience as an anchor and a, uh, a reporter in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Honolulu, Hawaii, and also San Diego, California. Deanne Divis uh, is from Columbus, Nebraska, and she is an award-winning journalist uh, with Al Jazeera on commercial space, NASA, robotics, and emerging technology sectors. She has written extensively on science and technology for such outlets at uh, Press International, Aviation Week, and the Los Angeles Times. Matthew Hansen, a name I think a lot of you might be familiar with because of his uh, reporting uh, in Nebraska. He is the executive editor of the Flat Water Free Press, which I subscribe to and I hope you do as well. It's Nebraska's first independent nonprofit newsroom focused on investigative journalism and also feature stories. Uh, prior to that, he spent 16 years working at Nebraska newspapers, including the as a reporter for the Lincoln Journal Star and a reporter and columnist for the Omaha World Herald. And finally, we have Tony Herman with us. He is the local government reporter for the Hastings Tribune, where he covers the Hastings City and Adams County boards and commissions. He shares in the coverage of the Hastings Public Schools and he covers general assignment stories and some high school sports. So these are our panelists for today and we are having uh, this presented in a question and answer format. So we're going to begin uh, by let, letting each panelist tell us about their careers. And so the basic question is, how did you get started in journalism? And we're gonna turn uh, first to Deanne. Hi, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I started at the Columbus Telegram, which was sponsoring a junior achievement newspaper for high school students. And so what they did is they published our paper within the city paper once a month, and we did it all. We sold ads, we wrote stories, we actually laid it out, we did the whole thing. And we did, I did that for two years and learned a lot, you know, working hands in hand in glove with the staff. They, they taught us it wasn't exactly an apprenticeship because we only ran once a month, but we, I learned an enormous amount. Went to college and got completely enamored of the idea of commercial space and did an undergrad thesis and found this little company in Washington that was working to commercialize a space, a reusable space vehicle. And you can see the behind me, one of the models, one of the early versions. And so I talked my way in and went to work for them ended up um, in, the, in the Washington office doing a lot of stuff, including going on the Hill. And so that, you know, that was the first tranche, you know, Elon Musk and all those guys, they weren't the first, but it was too early. And um, when the editor of GPS World came knocking, he'd been asking around for someone to cover Washington. And they, someone suggested me based on my experience in Washington so far. And I wrote my first column I got a call from the, I think it was the, at the time, the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House the day after it appeared, and it just took off. And so I did that, and it was a column for a magazine, then it was a newsletter, then it was two magazines and two newsletters. I ended up in, at one point going over to McGraw-Hill. I got hired to run the science and technology coverage then for United Press International. And so they were sort of in a relaunch mode. 
and um, I rebuilt that and then moved on to a daily newspaper called the Washington Examiner. Another, it was a restart. It was an old paper that was being reformulated. It was absolutely fantastic fun to run a daily paper and we ran circles around the post if I do say so myself. <laughs> and, um, and then when that paper was closed to, it was reformulated to be just a magazine focused on politics. So the local news folks went off to do other things and I went off to launch to go back where writing about GPS and drones and artificial intelligence and help launch a magazine. I was the launch editor. And um, here I am now. I still write about space and still cover Washington. And it's enormous fun. So we're going to go from national to local. And Tony, tell us a little bit about how your career in journalism started. Yeah, uh, for me, it started in high school, I took an intro to journalism class, uh, I believe my junior year of high school. And I remember the first assignment I wrote in the intro to journalism class was a feature about the starting quarterback uh, for the football team. And it turned out pretty good, a lot better than I thought it would. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll stick with this. So then when I was a senior, I did a lot more. I, I was a staff writer on the high school paper and wrote a lot more and decided to pursue that. When I was in college, I went to Kansas State and was a, uh, again, took the all the necessary journalism cor courses. And then uh, as I was getting along in my time in college. I was a, a reporter for the, the Kansas State Collegian. And at one point, I think I was one of a handful of uh, staff writers chosen to follow a presidential campaign for the student student body president, um, which was you know somewhat prestigious within the, the staff. Um, and so I had you know, followed the journalism path all, all through college. And then when I was getting ready to graduate, I applied to a handful of newspapers um, around the Midwest, including the Hastings Tribune. And it turned out that when I was applying for a job, there was another reporter at the Tribune who had been the editor in chief of my college newspaper when I first started there. So she kind of put in a, a good word for me with our managing editor. And that would have been in spring of 2005 when I was getting ready to graduate from uh, college. And I've now been at the Tribune for about 16 and a half years. And we have a small enough staff and a large enough coverage area that it seems like I've done just about everything. Um, there's a lot of overlap between what we all do. Yeah. Uh, high school football and basketball games, but also um, city council and school board meetings, you know, all in the same week. And uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, slice of life in, in Hastings in, the, in South Central Nebraska, North Central Kansas. Well, it's important that those important connections that you can make in college, I think in high school as well. And full disclosure, I was the editor of the uh, University of Nebraska at Kearney Antelope, which was Kearney State College at the time. We're now turning to Sharon, who has broadcast experience, but again, starting in uh, Scott's Bluff. So Sharon, tell us about your career in journalism and how you got started. Well, this all started in college where I had actually changed my major about five different times. Um, and finally, I ended up with newspaper journalism, and I thought it was fun, but then I had the option of checking into broadcast journalism, so I took that class and fell in love with it. I just loved the writing style, and um, so from there, I ended up landing an internship at KTLA in Los Angeles, so I got a real taste of what it was like to be a TV journalist. I had gone out with the crews and saw what life reporting on the streets was like, and that's where I got the real bug. We all know that in journalism, you don't start out in Los Angeles. So it took me a couple years to find my footing and I landed at Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Um, in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, I was a reporter and anchor, but in a small market, you were not just that, you're chief cook and bottle washer. So I was producing my own shows. I was going out, I was shooting my own stories. I was editing them. And then I would come back and put them together 
And then I would hop on the anchor desk and anchor, you know, the nightly news with Jerry Deshang, who is actually a very long time veteran here in journalism in Nebraska. So then I spent two and a half years in Scotts Bluff and it was time to move on. So from there, I went to 1011 News in Lincoln and I spent two years there. And um, th there I was more of an anchor in the Grand Island Bureau, which was interesting. I covered my first tornado, which was really fun for a girl that came from California. <laughs> and then um, I spent two and a half years in Grand Island as the anchor reporter for 1011 News in the Grand Island Bureau. And then from there, I went to Colorado Springs where I kind of hung up the anchor shoes and more concentrated on reporting there. And I think that's kind of where I really learned how to tell a story because my news director there was really about storytelling. So he would kind of steer us in the right direction. Nope, you're missing the forest for the trees. No, you need to focus more on, you know, this aspect, you're just scratching the surface. That's where you, where I really learned what it meant to dig for a story and put a story together. So I worked in uh, Colorado Springs for two and a half years. And then from there, I went to Honolulu, Hawaii, got yeah, quite the change. <laughs> it went from cold to pretty much beautiful weather every day. And in Honolulu, it was really fun because there I also learned to kind of refine the skill of storytelling as well. But that's a really fun market because it's not just Honolulu that you work in. I mean, we were taking planes to other islands to also cover stories that happen on the other islands too. And I think that was really interesting for me because that you really learn to figure out how to meet the deadline because now you're not only dealing with getting your elements for your daily story, but you also have to work in travel time too by plane because you pretty much went over there for the day, got what you needed, and then you were on the evening news by five or six o'clock presenting your report. So you really learn how to work fast. So then after uh, Hawaii, I decided I really missed my family on the mainland and uh, living in Hawaii was for the birds. And so I ended up landing a job in San Diego, which was then XETV, which was the CW station. And um, there again, I learned to more refined the storytelling skills and really learning how to become a good, good journalist. And I think that's kind of what the journey of the broadcast television does is you go from market to market and market each time you go to a bigger market. And so there you learn to refine your storytelling a little bit better. In San Diego, we had live reporting in Colorado Springs and as well as Hawaii. But I think in San Diego, you really learned to really refine that uh, live reporting skill because I remember telling my news director I was a regular reporter for evening shows but the opportunity came up to become a morning live reporter and I told her I wanted to do that because on the morning show all you do is live shots and so I really wanted to refine that skill of learning to be a live reporter and that's what I did for two years on the morning show and then I went back to the regular shift. And I worked at that station for six years. And then um, the opportunity came up to jump ship and go over to Fox 5, which is what I did. And there I worked for six years and I covered everything from um, major mayor races for San Diego from you know Bob Filner, the guy who got ousted to wildfires. As we all know, California's big on wildfires. And so I've covered, you know, many, many wildfires in um, San Diego. And that's always, that's always an adrenaline pumping experience. And from there I went to, um, I also did border coverage, a lot of border stories there too. And so San Diego was a really good market as far as I was a general assignment reporter. And so what happens when you're a general assignment reporter is you kind of cover the gamut. And that's exactly what it was. Everything from city politics to wildfires to border issues, you name it, I pretty much covered it in San Diego. And so after working at Fox 5 for six years, 
I decided I really kind of was tired of doing the runaround. And I was also feeling anchoring there as well, which was great, but the schedule was never consistent. Sometimes you work day side, sometimes you work morning, sometimes you work night side. And so I really wanted an opportunity to work full time as anchor. And so that's how I ended up here. And so now I've come full circle in my career, starting from Scotts Bluff, going all those cities, and then back here to Nebraska again here in Omaha. And so here in Omaha right now, I'm one of three main anchors at the NBC. Um, but I don't just anchor. I also do stories here too. But here I'm learning how to do more long form stories, not just your regular two minutes. I maybe get three or four minutes to really get into an issue. Thanks, Sharon. And we're going to then now turn to uh, Matthew Hansen. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started in journalism. I know you're from Red Cloud. And so uh, tell us the story about your career path, Matthew. Yeah, it really did start at uh, Red Cloud and Red Cloud High School. Um, I was a sort of an aimless teenager, didn't really care that much about school, didn't really know what I was going to do with my life, and just kind of happened into Carol Kennedy's um, journalism class. And it, it was really the first thing that I ever loved to do, tied to the fact that I, it was the first thing that I thought after I did it, um, that I had some skill at, at doing the thing. So writing and reporting really has been um, kind of the, the animating driving force of my um, life, at least my professional life since I was 16. Um, and, that, and, and actually my first internship uh, after my, I think my freshman year of college was at the Hastings Tribune. I had predated you just a couple of years, um, Tony. So, um, you know, I've worked, I've, I wrote for the Red Cloud Chief, which is the, the, the newspaper in my small town, um, the, the Tribune, and then obviously the, the Journal Star and the 16 years at the World Herald before we started this, can't really see the logo behind me, but the Flatwater Free Press, that, that is the our, our logo, which is a statewide journalism nonprofit, which I'll, um, I'll talk about more later. But yeah, it's, it's, it's just really been a thing that it feels like at this point that I've, that I've always um, done. It's, uh, it's certainly in my, in my DNA. Well, thank you, Matthew. And we are looking forward to hearing more about the flat water free press. You guys do a great job, I think, uh, with journalism. Anyway, so our next question, and we're going to throw it out to Sharon first, and she already talked a little bit about this, but what kind of topics or subjects have you uh, covered as a reporter? And Sharon, you've mentioned wildflower, uh, wildflowers, all sorts of things, local government. So tell us a little bit about what you've covered and maybe maybe kind of your favorite topics that you've covered in your career. Um, I love the breaking news as far as for being a reporter. And this is what I really worked on a lot in San Diego is I was the breaking news reporter, one of the senior reporters in the newsroom. So whenever something happened, whether it be a crash, wildfire, um, you know, a crime, I pretty much jumped up and said, okay, I'm going. And that's kind of where I really learned to refine my reporting skills. Because when you're out in the field and something's breaking, you don't have really any time to think about it. You just gotta do it. Um, the other thing that I really like to is um, in Colorado Springs, I did a lot of military reporting because you know Colorado Springs is a very strong military um, hold there. So I actually did a lot of stories with um, NORAD which was really fun going in and looking at the behind the scenes. I mean, it was the real behind the scenes of our military and, you know, the role that they played and just how they helped our troops in the field. I think that was really interesting too. That was one of my favorite stories. And then, um, I mean, the, my coverage runs the gamut because in San Diego, I also at one point traveled to China to cover two San Diego pandas that were sent over there to kind of, help with the research on um, the pandas that were endangered and how to basically find a way to kind of increase their numbers in the wild. Sorry, my dog is here with me. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, Sharon. Matthew, why don't you tell us about uh, some of the topics you've covered in your career? Sure, it really has, uh, like with Sharon, run the, run the gamut. I started off, my first a professional job was covering higher education uh, for the Journal Star. So the university, big deal um, in Lincoln, um, ended up covering, that was at the 
kind of outset of the the Iraq and Afghan uh, wars. So I ended up covering um, the military a lot, which was not a beat at the Journal Star. It became a thing that that we obviously focused on more though, and continued that then at the at the World Herald. Um, went to Afghanistan. Um, went to to Cuba for a, a couple different reporting projects, um, and and then you know sort of went from that at the World Herald to a columnist job that that really was. Um, you know, took me in every different direction I wanted to go. Um, a lot of human interest stuff I did, um, uh, a lot of investigative stuff. Um, we worked for a long time on a, an investigation of, of Goodwill Omaha. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I did with another World Herald reporter, Henry Cordes. Um, so yeah, it's really, uh, there's been a lot of uh, variety, but I, I really think the core of my interest in journalism is, um, stories about people. I, I, I think that that, you know, kind of that storytelling and trying to get people to connect to issues, topics, um, through the, the stories of fellow human beings is kind of the, it, that's the connective tissue um, uh, of the different kind of stuff that I've done in, in journalism. Okay, thanks, Matthew. We're gonna to turn to Tony now. We know that Tony covers government both at the county and city level, also sometimes sports and sometimes the school board. Uh, so tell us about some of the topics that you've covered, Tony, um, in your career. Yeah, uh, for me, the biggest thing when it comes to coverage and you know a daily newspaper is the community aspect. Um, now it's letting the community know what the local um, city council or school board or, or county board has decided um, I've been the local government reporter for about seven years. Uh, before that, I spent about eight years as our regional reporter. So that's where I focused on our coverage area outside of Hastings and Adams County, including um, uh, Webster County and Red Cloud. And it was, uh, it was always important for me to be kind of a representative to, of Hastings and the Tribune in these small communities. And then when I was writing the story, to be a representative of these small communities in Hastings and in the Tribune. So um, just a, a, a lot of everything. And in fact, I think I met Matthew a long time ago at a uh, opening of a, a bookstore in Red Cloud that I had written about prior to its opening. But, uh, you know, along the way, uh, you know, some of the more interesting and unusual things, I think I covered uh, three bank robberies uh, in small towns, two of which where the robber got away. The, the incident where he was caught, he was caught because the robber was wearing the same jacket he had on in his Facebook profile picture. So, you know, that's just kind of a, a slice of life in um, small town Nebraska, I suppose. Okay, we're going to go from local now to national, a little bit international. Uh, Dan, tell us about, uh, you, we know you, you cover technology, so tell, tell us about some of the interesting topics you've covered in your career. Um, I, th I think the, all the topics, uh, well, first, I've been a reporter and an editor. So when I was the editor for United Press International, we covered everything. Everything from, from nanotech to medical journals and what they were reporting to UFOs stem cells. Um, I mean, we just, we did one on one great story on a mathematical formula to predict the progress of sand dunes. And so we had enormous range. The thing I love about being reporters, I am never bored. Um, always something. The, of the things that I've covered, commercial space, of course, that was, you know, and that's, that's, I've covered NASA. I've got to see a lot of, I've seen a number of launches, which are amazing, I've got to travel. Um, I've also covered biodefense. I was in charge of the coverage of the anthrax attack after 9-11. And so that was a global effort. We had, at that point, I had about three dozen stringers around the world. So we reached out to them, we covered it in Washington. And that led me to be writing about biodefense, including an investigative series that I did with um, a person who was on staff who had been the former investigative editor for the New York Times, Nick Horak. And we looked at this sudden mushrooming of biodefense labs across the US. 
And so then the risks that they posed, and then I continued to write about that. But the, the anchor of what I've done for most of my career was GPS and satellite navigation and other aspects of navigation. And it sounds kind of dry, but GPS underlies the entire economy. All the synchronization necessary to make your cell phone work, your ATM spit out cash, your, your internet smoothly give you data, all of that is synchronized with the GPS signal. And so over the years, I have covered uh, the military because it is a military system. I've covered the commercial aspects, amazingly creative people. I've covered cybersecurity because there's all sorts of issues um, in terms of making sure that your GPS signal is, is available. Um, I've covered, you know, whether or not you know, the, the, the machinations between the US and other countries over arms sales and their ability to include or not include and whether or not those arms would sell. Um, it's, it's been, and the spectrum fights sound like a big yawn until you realize that somebody rented a castle to get everybody on his side with this grand party at, and, um, that if the spectrum is interfered with, the combines won't work in Nebraska, you aren't going to be able to adequately get your 911 calls directed to the right, get the an emergency people to the right place. And, and so as you dig around in this and you find out the ramifications and you follow the, the fights and the spats, all this stuff sort of happens sub rosa, it's fascinating. It's, it's an investigative story that never stops. And, um, and it has taken me into all sorts of places. And the, the one other thing I would add that it's not necessarily coverage, but has been a highlight. Um, after covering the biodefense, I won a, an award to go study at MIT for a year. So it's like somebody handed me a spoon and threw open the doors to the Bas Baskin Robbins factory and said, go for it. And, um, and it was just amazing. And I, I still benefit from that, which was, you know, for, for those who are interested in going into journalism, you know, keep an idea, keep an eye open for these unusual opportunities. I didn't know about it, but a colleague told me about it and sort of pointed me in that direction. And, and it, was, it was amazing. We got to travel and I went down to Mexico and saw the monarch butterflies. Um, we did amazing, amazing amount of stuff. So it's really been fantastic. I'm looking forward to many more years of doing this. And, um, and I encourage anybody to, to get into journalism. Um, some of you already answered this, but just sort of quickly going over this. The next question is, what do you like most about being a journalist? And just maybe mention a few things. We're going to start with Matthew there. So what do you like best about being a journalist? And a lot of you have talked about what you enjoy about it uh, in your previous answers. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I will be quick. I mean, it, it's it's it, it speaks to what Deanne what was just talking about. It's curiosity. It's the idea that you get a notebook and a pen, at least in the old school uh, way to do this, and you go around and you talk to people, and you know they unload their their brains, their hopes, their fears, uh, their desires um, to you. Um, you know, for a shy kid uh, uh, from a small town to have the world open up to you that way. Um, it's just really, it's, it's the best job um, to, to be able to, to do that on a, a, a daily, weekly um, basis. I mean, I've, you know, sat down with U.S. senators and, you know, four-star generals and also, um, you know, hung out with uh, homeless people, and it's all been uh, valuable in its own way. Good, thanks, Matthew. Tony, what do you like best about being a journalist? Yeah, uh, you know, kind of going back to what I said before, just community. I think the I'd like to think the Tribune is held in fairly high esteem in the the Hastings community. Uh, it's always affirming to have people come up saying, telling me how much they liked something I've written or, um, you know, organizations that I, I cover on a regular basis, uh, including the, the League of Women Voters. I think we have several Hastings League of Women Voters uh, members on this webinar. And it's been fun to kind of 
make those relationships and be kind of the uh, um, the conduit between these people and these groups and, and the community. Right, thank you, Tony. And now we'll go to Deanne. Tell us what you like most about being a journalist. Well, like I said, I'm never bored. And that's, that's fun. And because I cover technology, I get to explore things like artificial intelligence and drones. I, I was one of the first people to cover drones and as, as they evolve. Um, my experience also includes launching news publications. And that's been really, really cool. Um, the, you know, I've done the wire, the wire service when I joined, had one and a half people covering science and tech. By the time we got fully running, it was 36 stories a day with, you know, a stringer network and staff. And we did so many interesting things. And the examiner was a completely different thing. We covered local news. And though the post is, is a, amazing, the, the local news, I think, didn't always get as much attention because there were so many compelling stories that they were covering. And so we covered local and I mean, we covered police beat. We broke stories across, you know, across the region and we won a bunch of awards. And, um, and so that was, that was, I just, I think the opportunities are there um, and it's just, it keeps my mind occupied. I always, my biggest, my biggest problem is I got six things I'm interested in time for two. And so I'm, it's hard to choose. It's so hard to choose. Well, thanks, Dan. Now, Sharon, what do you like best about being a, a broadcast journalist? I think a lot of it was what um, you guys have all been saying, which is th there is an endless opportunity to learn. Learn from the people that you talk to, but also the topics too. But also um, what um, Tony was saying too, as far as connections to the community, I, that's the part I love about my job is keeping connected to the community, talking to people in the community, learning from people in the community. But also um, one aspect too is giving the voice to the people who don't have a voice, giving a voice to the voiceless, because there's a lot of situations out there where they don't necessarily know how to approach it, how to speak about it. And we give them that opportunity to tell their stories. And um, I also, what uh, Diane said about never bored. Yes, that's how I am in my career. I'm never bored. Um, I think that being a broadcast journalist is very exciting. Your day can go from sitting at the desk, figuring out what to do for your story for the day. The next thing you're out the door covering a huge breaking story that sometimes ends up as a national coverage thing. For, for example, you know our Heartland floods that started out as a flood in you know Fremont. And then the next thing you know, three days later, we're covering a huge swath of Eastern Nebraska that's being inundated with flooding. So it changes constantly. It's never the same. Your day to day, it's never the same. So I think that's probably what's most exciting. And then plus, I just, I love the storytelling. I love the writing. Thanks, Sharon. We're going to shift gears a little bit from talking about yourselves to talking about your news organization. So how do you believe your news organization is viewed by the public? And Tony, we're going to start with you. Yeah, um, I, uh, I had a situation in 2016 uh, where we had a, an open uh, mayoral race in Hastings. And we had, I think it was two or maybe three of the candidates to announce their candidacy um, got a hold of me and said, you know, how, how should I do this? How do you want to do it? And they chose to go through the Tribune to announce that they were running. And um, we've had uh, controversies uh, where um, you know, people on two different sides are trying to make their case and choose to um, do that through the Tribune, either through a, um, a paid advertisement or a uh, letter to the editor to kind of state their case and say, this is why this is important to the community. This is why this is important to me. So I think, you know, even now in 2021, when 
the role of newspapers, you know, maybe isn't what it was decades ago. Um, I, I think people in this area still see the Tribune, and I assume it's this way probably all around the country. People see their their local newspaper as um, the best way to kind of get their their voice out in the public. Well, certainly, that's what we heard last week with the Pew Research is that people trust the local news, both broadcast and print, more than the national news. So Sharon, another local news uh, reporter, anchor. So what do you think people uh, feel about WOWT Channel 6? Well, I, for one, we are the legacy station here in Omaha. We've been here the longest. Um, I think us and KE are the main two stations here in Omaha. I think that WOWT, a lot of people focus on our weather. Uh, because we do have a really good weather team, Rusty and uh, Clay, David, and now we also brought in Emily too. And I think that when it comes to weather, they are really on top of it when it comes to especially severe weather. Um, on top of that, I think our reporters are really good about, and this is what I talked about, that community aspect. Our reporters are really good about getting into the community and telling those community stories. Um, we are not a news station that relies on press releases. And I think people know that, which is why we get a lot of emails from people saying, hey, I've got this great story idea, um, you know, suggestions from the community of things that, you know, we can cover. And I see that myself because I get a lot of those emails. But I think that that's kind of what um, WOWT is, is seen for. And then plus we have a lot of veterans too that have been a part of this market for a really, really long time. And I think we're known for that. We have John Nicely and Mike McKnight, you know, for our investigative stuff, which is something else we're known for as well. And then we have a lot of veteran journalists too, like John Chapman and Brian Mastery. So um, I do think that we're known for people who've been in the market for a really long time. And that lends to credibility too, for our station too. Sharon, now we're going to turn to Matthew. And I think this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about the flat water free press, which is this sort of a new thing going on in journalism. I saw it when I was in Iowa. They also had a nonprofit uh, newspaper pop up there. So Matthew, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you believe your organization that you work for now is perceived by the public. And if you want to say anything about the World Herald or the uh, Lincoln Journal Star, uh, do that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, newspaper guy my whole career. Um, and, you know, those years, uh, uh, 2000 or so to, to 2019 is when I left the World Herald, um, you know, they weren't kind to the business of newspaper journalism. Um, so, you know, in this backdrop, and I, I know that Tony understands this, and I'm, I'm sure Deanne does too, like, so you're doing your job, which you love and think is really important, but, you know, you're doing it in this environment where, um, your coworkers every few years, you know, a couple of them get laid off or there are buyouts or, you know, and it, it, there's the um, uh, fewer and fewer newspaper chains owning more and more newspapers, um, uh, which affects things as well. So, so to be quite honest, by 2019, I loved the job, but I didn't love the, the kind of newspaper industry um, anymore, which is why I left. Um, and, and so it's really exciting to get back into it, this, this profession that I do love and think is really important through this idea of a statewide journalism nonprofit. I think the, the number that our um, executive director, Matt Wynn, cites is that there are half as many reporters in Nebraska as there were 20 years ago. Um, so in this environment where there are fewer and fewer of us and there are more and more PR people, um, working to protect companies or, or uh, politicians, um, you know, we thought it was really important to develop this, this statewide journalism nonprofit that would focus on our, our full-time reporters who, by the way, you can't see them, but they're sitting um, a couple feet from me, both dil diligently working, it appears, so much so that they don't even know I'm talking about them. They, um, uh, they're fo they, and they started, by the way, eight days ago. So we're real new, right? Um, but the, uh, they're focused on their first projects. And then we have this um, uh, freelance feature side that is much more focused on stories that bind 
uh, Nebraskans together. One of the other things that I think has been lost in specifically in print journalism, but really I think overall in journalism in Nebraska is this statewide focus. Stories from every, you know, that, that, that was the uh, 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 sort of focus of the World Herald for generations, right? It would go to the uh, Wyoming border, um, get trucked to the Wyoming border every morning. Um, and there were stories from places that were eight hours um, from Omaha, but still inside Nebraska. So with our freelancers, we're really working to get stories from around the state. We just had a story a couple weeks ago about a, a cafe in, in Newman Grove that's figured out how to use social media to its benefit and ha is the busiest it's ever been in the 21st century, even though it's in a, you know, a tiny town in Nebraska. Um, so it's just, that's one example. Um, yeah, it, it's really, and how we're perceived, and I, I realize I've uh, gone over my allotted two minutes here, so sorry about that. But how we're, how we're um, perceived is really interesting. It, it is the most hopeful that I've been about journalism since I was a young reporter. Because to, to watch the reaction to this, to watch um, kind of people's connection to the idea that we need to preserve certain things about journalism and print journalism, um, that they're, they're too important to go away. Um, so people through financial support, through signing up for our email newsletter, which you can find, by the way, at flatwaterfreepress.org, um, uh, you know, it, we've beaten every metric that we set uh, for the end of year 2021, and we've done that. We did that basically by Halloween. We actually had to set new goals because it, it, it has gone so much better than, than we had um, originally assumed, and and. Um, you know, it, it's going to continue to get better as we um, uh, start to do kind of the investigative piece of this. And also, as uh, you know, I'm very hopeful that we're going to expand quickly, um, which is, again, is not that's not a thing that I'm used to um, from from being a, a veteran of of newspapers. So, yeah, the nonprofit kind of way to do this work, I think, is uh, it's going to help write the next chapter in American journalism at RBAs in a lot of states around the country and in national nonprofits like ProPublica. Um, and so I'm very hopeful that, that, that this thing, Flatwater Free Press and others like it that'll come uh, up over time are, are gonna kind of carry us forward um, in, the, in the generations to come. Thanks, Matthew. And again, if you have not subscribed to Flatwater Free Press, I encourage you to do so. I've also been impressed again uh, with the fact that the Omaha World Herald runs some of your stories. I still get the paper version of that paper and did a great job on Thurston County and their COVID vaccinations. I love that story as well. We're going to now turn to Deanne and she's worked for numerous publications. So maybe talking a little bit about how you think maybe the national media is perceived by the public as far as uh, your profession. That's that's a really huge question. I'm not sure I'm I'm capable of answering it. The publications that I've worked for, I think we're all seen as as being experts in what they were covering, but all the publications I worked for were what I call old school. Um, you know, the classic reporting, you know, check your sources, get additional sources. Um, I, I subscribe to the, uh, the rules of ethics of the Society of Professional Journalists, and, and everybody worked for me. You know, I expected them to do it right. And because we did it right, I believe that we were seen as an expert source. I mean, the examiners ran, the examiner ran a regular column called Most Wanted from the Police. It got to the point when people saw themselves in there, they turned themselves in. Um, you know, and so you know, we really did some excellent work. UPI did some excellent work. The current situation is difficult for, you know, for the media, um, for all the reasons that were just described. Um, I see a lot of bright spots. The emergence of expert newsletters, I think is, is something that's, and some of the specialty publications. Um, some of the, the publications that focus on particular topics, they're not broadly read by the public, but they do some extraordinary work. Um, I've always been impressed. I, in the beginning, I thought trade publications, well, you know, they're not, you know, they're not as hard hitting. And maybe that's the way it was before, I don't know, but boy, that's not true now. 
they do some of the best work out there. So there's a lot of bright spots. I think there's a lot of, of bright spots for local news. Um, and we're just going to have to see what happens. I think it's all very much evolving. So. Well, I have been sort of watching. I know there's lots of questions from in the chat. So I'm turning this over right now to Angie. It's about, we've got about 14 minutes left in our program. So she is going to pose some questions um, from the audience for the panelists. Well, thank you to everyone who has posted questions. There are some really interesting ones, and I hope we have time for as many of them as possible because I, I want to know the answers to these. But on the heels of what we were most recently discussing, uh, posed by Tobin Beck, how do you fact check to ensure that what your sources are telling you is correct? And then how do you go about doing background research prior to covering a story? So that I don't think this is directed to any one of you in particular, but if you just like to start, just indicate by raising your hand and give me a quick nod and I'll start with you. Anybody feel like motivated to speak to that? I'm sure this is of interest to our entire audience. Tony, thank you. We'll have you go first. Yeah, I think, um... In terms of you know going beyond sources as well as kind of getting prepared before an interview, I've tried to uh, go through documents as much as possible. If there's a, a contract that the city council is voting for, voting on, that contract will be in the agenda packet. So it's just making sure um, that I know what that is, and uh, if need be to call the city administrator or parks and rec director to get um, more information to be prepared even before the city council meeting goes before it starts and um, and then yeah I guess it's it's talking to other people involved in the situation uh, to, to make sure what uh, what I'm being told is or what's being told in public is is correct is verifiable Thank you. Sharon, we'll go to you next. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, sources are just your, your, your beginning point. It's a stepping stone. Um, whenever I get information from a source, your next step is to confirm it. You either seek out an official to find, you know, ask them about that information, what they know about it, if they can confirm it. And if you can't get that official to confirm it, then you find another one. I usually do at least two or three different officials before I know for sure that is the case and it can be confirmed, especially on a crime scene. You have to be real careful. Like sources can give you information, but you have to make sure that what they're telling you is the truth. Because I think our main job as journalists is what we put out there has to be accurate. You can't obviously report wrong information because our job as journalists is to be accurate in truth in detail right so I think that that's really important is to confirm the information that your sources give you and as far as background any story I cover I will sit there and read documents um, you know previous articles covered on the subject to make sure that I am well versed in that subject before I'm ready to cover that story Matthew thank you thank you Sharon I just have a quick story which uh, speaks to this and I, I want to tell it because Tony's on the, the call and a couple other people from Hastings are. When I was an intern there, uh, I think I was 19, I was asked to cover a school board meeting and I think the person, the education reporter was on vacation or something. And there were, there were two school board members, um, I think their names, and I could, you, you might know these people, Tony, so tell me if this is wrong. Um, uh, I think their names were Pam Deal and Wendy Keel. Um, uh, they were on opposite sides of some sort of contentious issue, which I've forgotten. Um, and my 19 year old self walked back to the newsroom, um, wrote the story and uh, transposed their names, kept their, so, so they were uh, now representing the, the position that they totally disagreed with um, in the story. As you might imagine, both Pam Deal and Wendy Keel were very upset as was uh, the editor of the Hastings Tribune um, at the time. Uh, uh, so I got a well-deserved uh, chewing out in his, in his office. And uh, it's really, I, I'm really glad it happened when it happened. I was again, 19, um, because it led me to a career where, I mean, lots of anxiety, 
related to the idea of of making sure that everything is right before you put the thing out as much as you can right nobody's perfect no no story is perfect if you went back and read any reporter's stories for for decades you could find things that are wrong <clears throat> factually wrong <clears throat> in those stories but um you know i don't think people necessarily understand a lot of times how insane reporters actually are um as to trying to to verify facts, double check, triple check, quadruple check, um, it, it's just it's a part of a lot of our DNA. And I know I've woken up a lot of times in the middle. Of, this is the main reason I wake up in the middle of the night, right? Is to think, oh, I wonder if I need to check X thing um, again. It's just really, really uh, important, I think, for all of us to try to get it right as much as possible. Thank you, everyone. Deanne, did you want to make another comment? I agree with what everybody said um, and, and endorse that. Um, I think the one other thing I would add is, is echo what, what Sharon was saying about doing your homework. If you do your homework in advance, especially in areas that I cover, um, and then you come in and you ask a really good question because you know of something and you, you've done your homework, you get such better answers and it leads to a, a whole I've, I have found that it leads to a relationship where you can go back and ask questions. And I've had people I sort of use as touchstones when I get really confused, who will let me call them at home and say, I don't understand this. And they'll say, no, no, it's, it's that, not this. And it's like, oh, thank you. And so to have those relationships where you can just ask somebody that stupid question and get it right is, is really helpful. Thank you, Dan. Now, on the heels of that, I'm going to post a question a little bit out of order, but Dan, can you speak to the complications involved in making technology understandable to the average reader and discuss some of the technology issues that may influence the future of the country that are not being covered very well? And that question is posed by Mary Lee Moulton. Um, the first thing to do is to understand it yourself. If you can't, and, and I, 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 use people, they're friends of mine, to, and, I'll, and I'll try something out on it. If they don't, if I can't explain it to them, I'm not ready. Um, and so, but to find good examples, uh, I remember writing a story about laminar flow, which is the way the air flows over a wing, which was relevant to when one of the shuttles crashed. And, and I, I, I can't quite remember how I got there, but I just kept trying it until I could explain how the, the air is, is it, it roils at a certain point. And that one wing was really, really rough, unusually so. So when the boy, you know, it's it's like uh, going over a stream when it hits the rocks, and and it pulled the wing. The the the, the way it was explained to me, the guy who's who it was really well placed to um, to to talk about it. It he believed it pulled the shuttle in such a way that it was basically flying sideways, and that was what led to the the um, disintegration of the shuttle. It's, it's understanding it, it's finding examples. Um, but, and, and, I, and to the second part of the question, I, I think artificial intelligence is misunderstood. Um, right now, we do not have artificial intelligence where machines can make leaps of intuition. So if you, know, if you see, if a, a, an artificial, uh, an automated vehicle sees a cop go like this with his hand up, or a cop, you know, like this, if it doesn't have the data fed into it to learn from, it can't necessarily tell the difference. And almost, when people talk about artificial intelligence now, that's really what they're talking about. There's nothing that I'm aware of, and I've asked this question repeatedly, um, that can make the, the intuitive leap that a, a toddler can make. And so this is going to take a whole new level of, of technology and advancement. I think, I think um, quantum computing is really interesting. I don't fully understand it myself, but I get the point um, that it is so powerful that a lot of the safeguards that we have in place aren't gonna work. And so people are already thinking about that. And, um, and so automation and automated vehicles are epic. It's gonna take a while. And in, for a lot of the reasons that I talked about, you've got to teach them. And if you don't give them the data, they don't know anything because you didn't teach it to them yet. And, and like children pick up stuff just 
being just being around. The automated automated vehicles don't do that, not yet anyway. So I'm I'm not sure if there's anybody who wants to ask about a particular technology. Space, of course, is epic, um, you know, and it's got a lot of ramifications that I think people don't appreciate yet for new materials and energy. Um, but it's going to be a while. I mean, the the movies make it look easy. This is not some made for TV movie that's going to be all wrapped up in two hours. It's going to be a generation or more, and but we are starting now. I mean, look at what happened with the internet. When I started, I didn't have the internet like we have now. Look what you can do now. It's amazing, mm -hmm. but it's also, it's also problematic because people did not consider at the beginning the things that are problematic now, like being able to build a computer and you can't do it. It's, it's too late. So thinking things through a little bit in the beginning helps a lot. Wonderful. Thank you for summing that up. Now, we have several excellent questions, but due to time, uh, we only have four minutes left. We want to honor everyone's time. So I think we just have time for one final one. And I think this is inspiring and uplifting for our audiences that might be considering a future in this. So again, from Tobin Beck, if you could give one or two sentences of advice to students considering going into journalism, what would you tell them? What should they consider? Uh, why should they consider it rather as a good career? And what makes someone a good journalist? So I think we'll just go through one by one in conclusion and give you guys a chance to think about this question um, and what parts you might want to speak to. Does anybody especially want to go first? I'll go first. Thank you. Um, for anybody who wants to be a broadcast journalist, this is a field that's one really hard to get into. And then once you're in it, you have to be, I think the number one word, that the, the best word to describe it is you've got to be persistent. Don't give up. Don't give up on if this is what you really want to do. If you want to be out there, if you want to find the stories, tell the stories, be persistent, be persistent in pursuing this job. And once you're in the job, don't take no for an answer. I mean, you do have to be respectful, of course, when you're covering a situation that might have involved a family that um, lost a loved one. But you still have to be persistent in the way and pursuing that story that you just don't give up. I mean, that's all I've done my whole entire career. And that's how I've gotten as far as I have. Difficult situations pop up. But if you learn to navigate and be persistent in the way that you handle it, and you'll learn eventually to handle it the right way, just the best thing for this career is just be persistent and don't give up and just keep on going. And the farther you persist in this career, the farther you're gonna go. Thank you, Sharon. Deanne, we'll have you to you next. Um, I, this is gonna be a little unusual. Um, I think journalism is great. I've gushed already about that. My advice for someone who wants to do this is one, be conservative in your finances because there's going to come a day when your publication gets sold or you're, you know, somebody tells you to do something you just know you can't do. And there's nothing that will put, give you, give you the confidence to say, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. And take, take your skills somewhere else is to have solid finances. And, um, and you just, it's just life, you know, in general, but it's, it's important, things are uncertain. The other thing is, from, you know, keep track of the people you meet. Get their phone number, get their cell phone, get their email, drop them a note every once in a while. One of the things I regret is that I've met so many interesting people over the years and I've kind of lost track of them. And they end up in the doggondest places. And I wish I, I, you know, we'd gone out for coffee once in a while. People are really the ones who drive it all. You're not gonna get it off the internet. People keep track of those folks even if it's informally, you will be amazed what comes out of it. What wonderful relationship building advice. Thank you, Deanne. That was a very wise combined answer. All right, Matthew or Tony, did either of you want to speak to this? We're right at the top of the hour. We have just a sure. couple I'll, moments I'll really, quick left. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Uh, when I talk to classes, I, I try to emphasize to students that there's nothing wrong with not going into journalism, right? If you are a person who who uh, needs regular hours and uh, you know desires kind of um, a lot of uh, structure, 
in in your your life and career, I would suggest that you not go into to journalism. If you are if you hear about something that's happening and you want to know more and you want to ask more and you know there that's just how you sort of exist as a as a human being, no matter what really the the topic is, um, I would suggest that it's a that it's a good career choice at that at that point. Curiosity. Thank you, Matthew. Tony, to you, anything? Yeah, kind of going off of what Matthew said, uh, you know, be prepared for a pretty wide open schedule. Um, you're working all the time, but really you can not work when a lot of people are working. Um, so that's an, it's an opportunity and a burden there. And I would say um, just kind of learn to love where you're at and what you're doing and um you know you can use that to uh you know move on to to something else and just kind of use that as inspiration for your your reporting wonderful thank you everyone for summing up diane as our moderator i'll turn over the final few words to you I just want to thank uh, all the panelists today. We've had two great webinars. Again, they're being recorded. And I know that there's uh, people that want the recording. And so we'll be posting that on our YouTube channel as well as on our website with a link to the YouTube channel. I want to thank our panelists as well as the other members, some of whom are in on this uh, webinar today of the Defending Journalism and the First Amendment Action Team of the League of Women Voters of Nebraska. So thank you for all your time and for sharing uh, incredible information with us today. With that said, we thank you so much for joining us today. We send you off into the beautiful afternoon that is a gift of today, and we wish everybody for a, the best for a wonderful weekend ahead. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye-bye.